Hello everyone, we'll be starting in a couple of minutes from now. Hi everyone, for those who just joined, we're going to start in about four minutes. We'll be starting at 12.05 sharp. Uh, for those who just joined us, just to give you an update, we're going to start the session at 12.05 sharp. So in another two minutes.
All right, let's get started. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy Friday. Thanks for joining on a Friday afternoon. Um, for those who've joined us on the Zoom meeting, um, I'm going to give you rights to talk. So if you have any questions, you can, rather than typing them, you can unmute yourselves and let me know. The only request is please be on mute so that we don't have any background disturbances as we're going through the session. Uh, for those who are uh, watching us on YouTube live, um, Welcome. You won't be probably able to ask me live questions, but if you could leave your questions on the comment section, uh, the Repristine team will get back to you as soon as they can with your uh, with the answer to your questions. Um, so with that, let me get uh, let me start with my introduction. My name is Mohil Pujara. Um, I am a faculty here at Repristine for about seven seven to eight years now. And um, I've been teaching this course in financial modeling at Edu Pristine. Um, I'm actually uh, an MBA in finance from Symbiosis University, International University. I've done my course in advanced analytics for management from IIM Ahmedabad. And I've been working in the industry with a company called Aspect Ratio uh, for about nine years now. And um, I work there as an engagement manager. We as a company, we work uh, in developing models for finance, uh, not just finance, but for marketing, supply chain, you know, different functions across the organization. But the focus uh, that we're going to have for this entire course and for this session today is, is going to be on financial modeling. My objective of meeting you here today is to give all of you a background about what financial modeling is, how can that skill set be useful uh, in the industry, what are the different career options that open up once you have this skill set in your back pocket? Um, and it's a it's a pretty interesting skill set. A lot of different industries within the finance space use uh, financial modeling. So I'm really excited to walk you guys through those different options. Um, before we begin, uh, let me check with you guys, uh, especially for the people who are who have joined us on the Zoom call. What do you think, uh, what comes to your mind when you hear the word financial modeling? Um, can, can anyone, what are your expectations from, from this uh, one hour session today? Anyone, any thoughts, any immediate thoughts that come to mind when we say financial modeling, what does it mean for you? Mean to you, sorry. Guys, anyone, please speak up. What does financial modeling mean? All right, looks like there are no responses, that's fine. Um, let me tell you what financial modeling means to me. I'd like to break the term into two different parts. Uh, first is finance and the second one is modeling. Finance, we all know what finance means. Uh, finance is the field uh, that deals with money and um, decisions about money. And you can have majorly three types of decisions. The first one is investment decisions. I have money, where should I invest that money? So that is one of the crucial uh, domains within finance. You make investment decisions in the field of finance. The second important decision that a finance person needs to make is uh, dividend decisions. Should I distribute the money that I have as dividend or should I reinvest them in the company? And the third uh, important decisions in the finance space that need to be made are financing decisions, which is what should the source of finance be? Should I employ debt into the business? Should I employ equity into the business? Uh, how should I, what should the right debt equity mix be, etc. So the field of finance is essentially about money and how to use that money and generate returns on that money, right? And we all, it's a very commonly used term. We are all familiar with the word finance. What is modeling? Modeling is this entire, um, it's an art and science of building financial models uh, and building financial models to take all the different decisions uh, that we just spoke about, be it investment decision, dividend decision, or financing decision. So modeling is the art and science of building Excel-based uh, models. And what does a model mean? 
a model is anything that takes an input, uh, does some processing on its own and gives an output. So a model is, it's an any automated solution of sorts where, uh, which reduces human effort. Uh, in the field of finance, when we're taking all the financial decisions, we need to do a ton of calculations uh, before we make a decision. The calculations can be for those who are from a finance field, you must be aware of terms like NPV, IRR, discounted cash flow. So when we take financial decisions, we usually do some analysis um, on, on these fronts before we make a decision. Uh, but those calculations are not straightforward. You need, they, they are uh, calculations that are lengthy and you need to uh, take, calculate a lot of different things before you actually get to your NPV and IRR and DCF or whatever you're working on. So modeling is this area where we automate all those calculations so that we don't have to do it over and over again because it's a time consuming process. And hence free up time for the most important thing, which is taking decisions. In the industry today, people spend most of their time in doing the same work over and over again. By having this financial modeling skill set, what we're doing is taking, taking away time spent on creating or calculating NPV, IRR, any, any financial decisions again, and moving that time and freeing up that time to actually focus on uh, the next steps or where, what decision should we take. So that's, that's the whole, at a very high level, at a very high level, that's what financial mo modeling means to me. It's this area of building models that can help support financial decisions. Uh, and by models, we mean automated tools that can help us really quickly perform large and complex calculations. But that, that's a very high level definition. Let us get into some details about it. So uh, financial modeling is one of the most fundamental and widely soft af sought after skills in the finance industry. It is the art of building a model using MS Excel. Um, I think let me pause here and first talk about why MS Excel. Usually in the finance industry, we work with data sets, which, which are say the profit and loss accounts, the balance sheet, the, the cash flow statement. Uh, and we can create our own models, which, which at the end of the day are not large the models or the data sets that we deal with are not huge data sets. We usually deal with data sets that are way less than, and uh, for guys uh, that, that are not familiar with this, Microsoft Excel has about 10, uh, 1 million rows of data, which is 10 lakh rows of data. And our financial data that we usually analyze is way lower than 10 lakh rows of data. Our models may be going to 10,000 rows, 20,000 rows, even one lakh rows at max in the in the extreme, most extreme scenario possible, it'll probably go to a lakh rows. But usually it does not go into 10 lakh rows of data. And uh, hence, Excel is a really good tool to build our models because it can support the data that we have. It's not huge in data size. Also, Excel is something that is fairly commonly used across the world almost everyone on this meeting today and I, I can, I'm sure about 99% of you would have at least opened an Excel file in some time in your life, right? So Excel is one of the most widely used tools. People are familiar with it. So that also helps in its adoption. Um, slowly and steadily, there are tools that are upcoming like R, Python, um, uh, sometimes the database is in SQL, sometimes Microsoft Access, but these are usually used when the data sizes are usually huge. And um, we, at least in the finance domain, use uh, maybe R or Python for some statistical analysis that we're doing, but we eventually end up building models in Excel because it's easier to send over an email. It's easier for the other person. Most of our clients also are familiar with Excel. Um, if we send them models in R and Python, they'll they usually uh, are not savvy with R and Python and they don't know how to run models in R and Python, but Excel, it's something that universally is kind of accepted within the finance industry now. So yeah, it's building a model in MS Excel to depict financial statements and analyze investments. It helps one to arrive at optimal business solutions by scrutinizing various parameters. Now, optimal business solution is the keyword here. 
it helps it frees up time to reach to spend more time on decision making and making the optimal decisions rather than you having to redo calculations over and over again we'll talk about this and i have a couple of good examples to show to you what i mean over here so let me move on to why financial modeling is required why in in general as a skill set why do you need to have financial modeling um and this is it for different people in different uh interest areas within the field of finance financial modeling is going to help you uh here here are some reasons why sorry are there any question here is there a question all right i thought someone raised their hands cool uh yeah so the first and foremost reason why financial modeling is required is it is required to uh do business modeling and decision making in firms so any firm before making a decision we don't uh we don't make decisions based on gut feel anymore um uh, in today's world with more and more data becoming available more and more decision making is being driven by numbers and in order to make decision based on numbers uh financial modeling is one of the most important skill sets it is a prerequisite and this is where things get interesting for you guys um it is a prerequisite for the equity research industry this is a first career option that opens up once someone has the financial modeling skill set financial modeling is a very very important and very essential essential skill set for the equity research industry what do i mean by equity research industry let me show you some examples uh i have this report here by a equity research company called motilal oswal it's a very popular company in india most of you would have heard of it uh, if not just google it it's one of the uh, leading in equity research companies in india so motilal oswal released a report on a company called hdfc bank hdfc bank is is a bank in india and it is listed in the stock market it is listed in nifty as well as sensex um uh, on 18th october 2020 which is about about 9 months back um uh, about 9 months back motilal oswal released a report on hdfc bank where in on uh, 18 october the share price for hdfc bank cmp means current market price was 1199 rupees which is 1200 rupees approximately motila loswal gave a buy rating they asked the investors to buy shares of hdfc bank on 18th october and they said that the target price for the bank shares of hdfc bank is 1400 rupees and uh, they gave this whole text over here is rationale behind why they think what is the valuation and view point why they think the share price of hdfc bank will go from 1200 rupees to 1400 rupees that's the whole rationale uh, that they've given here but my question to you guys is how do, why does motila loswal uh, predict that the share price of hdfc bank will go from 1200 to 1400 will give you a 17% upside and you should buy the share what gives them the confidence to print a report for their investors after which the investors will invest their money and they have the confidence of putting it on paper and re releasing a report saying buy the shares why does why do they get the confidence because they have a model that they've really built a robust model that helps predicting what the price can be and if i look today hdfc bank share price it is already at 1522 the share price of hdfc bank has already breached this target so if someone who had bought shares of hdfc bank on 18th october at 1200 rupees would have made about 300 rupees per share already 320 rupees per share already which is about a 30% increase right which is not bad for 9 months you earn 30% which is way higher than what your bank fd could probably give you similarly icici bank icici direct sorry not bank icici direct has a research on hdfc bank 
uh, they released this report on April 18th, 2021, about a uh, about three to four months back, where they said that they expect the target price for HDFC to go to 1700 in the next 12 months. So right now the price of HDFC Bank is 1522, uh, but it is on the way to 1700, right? So again, why does ICICI Direct give this recommendation? Because both ICICI Direct, Motila Loswal, companies like them have like a model like this, which they have running in the background where what they have the model predicting through a technique called discounted cash flow and they also do relative valuations there are different valuation techniques this, the intent of the session is not to get into all of the that but just to show you what kind of models run in the back end which help us derive a share price or come at a share price which we can then eventually recommend this is a model for another company but the intrinsic value or the fair value of the share price for this company is 28 rupees. We compare it to the actual share price in the market. If it is higher than the actual share price in the market, then we give a buy recommendation. If the intrinsic value or the fair value is lower than the actual share price in the market, we give a sell recommendation. But imagine because the business is very dynamic, every quarter the business keeps on coming up with updated results we want to tweak our model accordingly. So I go to the assumption sheet. This is another FMCG company, which has three major products, soap, hair colors, and detergent. And we're assuming growth rate in prices. Let's say we now assume that the price will grow instead of 5%, it will grow by 10%, right? The prices are going to grow by 10%. Um, and as, let's assume that the volumes remain constant. The volumes do not dip because of the price rise because the customers are very sticky. They have good brand loyalty. So even if they increase the price by 10%, the customers are not going to shift away. What does this essentially mean? If I'm increasing prices and have the same amount of volumes, my revenue goes up. If my revenue goes up, in that case, my uh, profit also goes up because no, my costs are not going up. Uh, only the variable cost may go up and my profits increase. If my profits increase, uh, that means the valuations get better. There is more money that I'm making for the shareholders, right? But I made these changes over here. I made these three changes over here. Now there are so many different things that go into building a financial model. I need to look at the PNL, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement, uh, how the revenues are changing, how the different costs are changing, uh, how the different assets fixed assets and depreciation is changing, the loans, if they're changing, taxes, equity. There's just a ton of things we need to take into consideration while building a model and coming up with the share price. Uh, can I request everyone to go on mute, please? I just have a question here. Um, uh, I, will, uh, I will give you some time for questions. Let me just complete this one concept, if that's okay. Thank you. Yeah, so, so after all these sheets, if we get to the DCF valuation, again, we go to the valuation, we see the share price has updated here. From 28, it has gone to 57, all right? So we made a change in the first sheet tab, but our valuation updated almost in instantaneously. It just took us 15 seconds to make a change. For people who do not uh, practice this um, skill set of financial model, modeling who do not build financial models usually will have to redo most of these calculations again and that alone takes them three four days to redo all the calculations in this case if we're building uh, models where we're writing formulas and we're making sure that the information flows from the first sheet to the very last sheet within 15 seconds we got an updated answer that if the if we increase the price by 10 percent but the costs do not go up or the or the volumes do not drop, the share price can go from 28 rupees to 57 rupees. So the decision now we're again spending more time on decision making rather than redoing the whole calculation again. So, and then based on a model like this, uh, Motila Loswal has a model like this for HDFC Bank, which tells them that the target price is 1400. ICICI Direct has a, has a, a model like that, which tells them that the price is 1700 rupees, right? So this is this is how usually companies um, 
create equity research models and then release equity research reports like the ones that we just saw. All right, I'll pause here for, for any questions. I think Karthik, you had a question. Uh, yeah, Mohel. Yes. Well, each sector will have a different parameters, right? When it Correct. comes to, yes. uh, so does that uh, sheet, the model sheet has all those parameters for all the sectors? Or? Uh, so that's a, that's a very good question. Um, usually within within a company like when we build models we have uh, a model for each and every company and even within a sector you know let's take the fmcg sector for example um, i'm going to take two fmcg giants itc and hul or let me even add dabur to it um, let me even add jyoti laboratories to it all of these sector wise they are all fmcg companies but each of them will have a different model because ITC has a completely different product mix. They are also into hotels. They are also into cigarettes. They are also into paper. They are also into agri. Uh, HUL has a completely different product set. So uh, sector wise, yes, there are certain things you need to consider. Uh, something like revenue drivers and cost drivers, etc. But your model will be company specific. Uh, you cannot take a HUL model and replicate that for ITC. You will still have to make a lot of changes to that. Uh, so your models change by each company. That being said, a banking business is completely different from an FMCG business. Uh, in banking business, uh, people deposit money with you and you, you earn money on lending that money to others and you earn interest out of it. So your business model is completely different than FMCG where you're selling products and getting your revenues, right? So, so yeah, in that way, there are specific industry or sector specific rules that you also need to be aware of before you build your financial models. Does, uh, do I, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, kind of partially answered all the question, but you're saying this particular spreadsheet is built by you and that is very specific to that particular company is what I'm hearing. Oh, for, for this particular, so yes. So if you're talking from a course perspective, uh, in the course, we cover three different industry. We cover the IT industry, we cover the FMCG industry, and we cover um, uh, a case study on Microsoft and LinkedIn, which technically uh, is within the IT, but it's not like a TCS or an Infosys. It's, it's a slightly different uh, business model there. Uh, so these are the sectors we uh, cover within the course when we do the course. So you'll have different models for uh, these different industries. And um, what we also do in the course is we give you a snapshot. There are some slides that we'll provide you, which will tell you. So if you're doing a, a telecom industry valuation today, what are the things? How should you approach it? If you're doing a valuation of a, a airline, what are the different, how should you tweak your model? What should you keep in uh, keep in mind when you're building that model? Uh, in a lot of the models, 80% of it would be the same uh, because your PNL, your balance sheet, your cash flow, all of those things will remain the same. Just that the line items here will change. So in case of an airline, you'll have probably something called fuel cost as well that gets added. Uh, which you probably won't have in a FMCG company. So things like that, the line items may change, uh, but the structure will remain the same. But the line items that will change, you will get uh, for each industry, what are the line items and what, what you should keep in mind, you will get information on all of that as well. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, Moel, it makes sense. Uh, just a uh, weightage given for each of those parameters will vary, right? So yes. like for, for uh, like the IT sector, the depreciation might not be that so high. But yeah. when it comes to commodity-based stuff, it is going to be on a high. So how does that, uh, you know, the proportionate um, value appreciation or the depreciation is going to be taken into model? Oh, so um, each and each model has something called, let's say we're, because we're speaking about depreciation, right? So we build something called a depreciation schedule, um, which is a waterfall. And over here, the rates can either come from your book depreciation or your IT depreciation. And this changes based on <coughs> companies act and different types of asset. For example, laptops and desktops will have a higher rate of depreciation. 
compared to a plant and machinery or a vehicle or something so those rates are also uh, taken according to the asset type and the industry that that asset is being employed in uh, so if you see over here if we are applying for plant and machinery the average depreciation is 18% but for it it is sorry but for laptops it is 33% so on and so forth so that kind of keeps on changing also depreciation changes between uh, what you are showing in the books of account and what you are taking for calculation of income tax so what depreciation rate should you take when all of those nuances are also considered when we build the model okay mohil one more question um to understand yeah. so uh, so what is the assumption that we make in this financial modeling we are assuming that um, business momentum is going to continue at the same pace right no when something no, 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 no. in macroeconomic no. factor changes yes you we do not so uh, um that's another good question uh, when we do our forecasting uh, we forecast for the future all right we have actuals for example this is a model that we built for a private equity company in 2016 so we had actuals until 2016 after 2016 we forecast numbers these numbers that we forecast so and this is for the broader group that's listening to us today whenever we doing our forecasting or whenever a motila loswal is telling hdfc bank ke shares kharido they're not they're not just looking at historical numbers and giving an a forecast they're also forecasting how the business is expected to perform in the future because when you're investing in a company today you're not investing in the company today for how it performed in the past but you're investing in a company today for how it's going to perform in the future and uh, taking an assumption that the future will replicate what happened in the historical is not a fair assumption to make because today the business environment is very dynamic changing almost every day so you need to take your assumptions uh, more accurately considering one the macroeconomic factors how they shape the industry that you are in and also business level factors the kind of decisions the management of the company is making uh are they employing more debt what is the financial strength of the company it's a lot a lot of other factors come into the play if they have a, a plan for a capital expenditure of 300 crores then and 300 crores will give us benefit in the future all of those different futuristic things need to take be taken into consideration rather than just considering past momentum so it is not just dependent on historical data does that make sense I am Mohil, but in the course, did you say that you are going to focus on only like three sectors? Oh, uh, so what we do, and I'll when I show the course background, it will become clear. Then, ah, uh, it's a seventy-hour course, and in seventy hours, you cannot go through twenty-five different industries. Um, what we focus on is you to understand how financial modeling works as a skill set, how to build models. and then you can apply that to different industries so we we focus on building the very core level skill or the logic and the 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 basic knowledge that you need to build models you can then apply that to all the other industries because if we try to squeeze in 25 models or 25 industries in 70 hours you will not understand anything in those 70 hours so that's that's kind of uh, the important thing to keep in mind here Okay, thank you. Awesome. All right. Uh, the next question we have is sorry. The next industry that we have is the investment banking industry. Investment banking industries usually um, uh, help with actually before I go to investment banking, private equity research can be done for companies that are already listed in the market. We saw that right. HDFC Bank is already listed in the market. but today and i guess today is the last day i am sure most of you must be aware of an ipo that's there in the market which is an ipo of a company called zomato right should you invest in the shares of zomato or not should you apply for that ipo or not that is also another thing which comes under the domain of equity research analyzing ipos of companies fpos of companies etc also comes under equity research companies So Motilal Oswal would also have released for their subscribers and investors a report on whether they should invest in the shares of Zomato or not, whether they should apply for the IP or not. Equity research companies also help in valuation 
for private equity and venture capital firms so these are usually um, early stage fundings when companies are in their early stage and this is funding which is required mostly for um, for private companies essentially i should also add private companies to the list so equity research cannot only happen for public companies that are trading you can use the same concepts to also value private equity private companies and venture capital investing so so these different areas open up once you have the financial modeling skill set the other skill set is for investment banking investment banking usually deals with mergers and acquisition and it helps companies raise funds through ipos or something ipos or even they go to banks and help raise debentures or debt or whatever so so when we talk about uh, investment banking that is another area that is impo of importance uh, and financial modeling is a skill set that can help us over there let me again show you another example uh this is a example where microsoft and linkedin uh the microsoft is um, again a uh, an it a big major it giant in the us uh, which has different solutions right from all your windows your word excel they have a lot of products and they also have solutions with which have to do with cloud and um uh, hosting websites and all of that and they're also into analytics they also are building games xbox is one of microsoft's products so microsoft is a huge it giant into different it it segments in the us linkedin was a professional networking firm it is in fact even today a professional net networking firm and what microsoft has done is they acquired linkedin in 2016 let me show you this ppt further here's the details of the deal in 2016 microsoft announced that they will acquire linkedin for 196 rupees per uh, sorry 196 dollars per share in an all cash transaction valued at approximately 26.2 billion the thing to consider here is and the share price of linkedin on june 2016 when the deal took place was 130 dollars per share so effectively microsoft gave about 66 dollars per share in addition to what the share actual share price in the stock market was uh on the date of acquisition why did microsoft go ahead and give a 60 dollar uh, or about a 50 percent premium to the existing linkedin shareholders so assume this you had a share of linkedin uh which was trading in the stock market for $130 microsoft comes and buys that share from you for $196 so you straight away within overnight you made $66 per share extra why did microsoft give a 50% premium to acquire linkedin shares uh, why did they decide that it should be an all cash transaction the other option is instead of giving cash to the shareholders of linkedin microsoft can give shares of microsoft to the shareholders of linkedin and they don't have to spend money for the acquisition then they 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 issued more shares but that will dilute ownership of course and how did microsoft decide that the overall value for linkedin will be 26.2 billion dollars all of these decisions an investment banking company helped them uh, with this entire process they built a whole financial model where they built different scenarios to to test out what happens if they acquire linkedin at 196 what happens if they acquire them for 200 250 150 so on and so forth and eventually they agreed on this particular price uh when we saw it's an all cash transaction microsoft is a it company it's a big it company it has 26.2 billion dollars of cash with it but what it eventually did is it raised 20 billion dollars of debt to fund the linkedin deal so when microsoft has already in its balance sheet it has a lot of cash it has say 50 billion dollars of cash why not use existing cash in the balance sheet and why increase debt or why go and take more debt that is another financing decision that that needs to be considered right so all of these decisions are something that investment banking companies help take 
and they help with such merger and acquisition deals and the structure of the deals and all of that so financial modeling again uh, like the model i showed there is another model that goes behind merger and acquisition so that's something that is also very important uh, financial modeling is important over there also the third area is commercial banking uh, banks are a very are one of the most popular source of funding or fundings for firm and before they release a loan or a debt and i'm not talking about your house loan or your personal loan or your vehicle loan or an education loan i am talking about loans that they give to corporates they also build models to understand whether the company will be able to repay the loan that they've taken or not whether the project or the the company that's asking for the loan whether they have a strong enough business model to generate enough cash to be able to repay the money that they're taking from the bank if they're not going to be able to repay the money that they're taking from the bank then in that case the bank will not give them a loan right so commercial banking jobs also require knowledge of financial modeling the next area is something called project finance project finance or capital expenditure decisions so think of any corporate okay in 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 my career for one and a half years i used to work with a company called vodafone uh, which is vodafone idea today and at vodafone we had to take decisions on whether to invest in a particular site or not uh, which is a site is is a network tower which usually costs about 75 lakh to 1 crore rupees so if i'm taking a decision on whether i should invest 1 crore rupees in putting a site in a particular area or not it needs to be a financial decision which i validate using my models to make sure that i am able to recover that 1 crore rupees uh, and it's not a loss making unit for me right so um, any corporate company always keeps on making investment decisions if it's an in fmcg company it will take an investment decision on whether to invest in a factory whether to invest in a particular machinery and what will the return on investment of that machinery be when will i be able to recover all the investment that i make on fixed assets all of these require again financial models to be built re require you to build different scenarios and uh, i have a good example here and help decision making so for all the capital budgeting decisions we look at npv irr payback period and things like that and we also look at different scenarios because most of these decisions have long term repercussions you're making an investment today but you'll see actual value after 5 years so you need to be able to also model different scenarios like we have here because today the situation is different today say the fuel prices are at rock bottom and if you build a model where you assume your cost to be very low and in 5 years fuel prices really rise then all your calculations go for a toss so you build different scenarios pessimistic pessimistic scenario assuming everything goes bad fuel prices rise raw material cost rise labor prices rise government does not give us clearance any and everything if everything goes bad what is my npv and irr like if it's negative i am not investing in that project if everything goes positive which is the optimistic scenario then what is the npv irr like so we can take into consideration different scenarios before we take a decision there so that's another field of finance that opens up and similarly we do project appraisal and risk evaluation we spoke about commercial banking and we spoke about project management as well which is in capital budgeting or uh, investment decisions so these are the different careers or skill sets that open up once you have the financial modeling skill set in your back pocket um uh, which also explains the benefits if you are looking for a job in these industries if you are looking for a job at similar to the kind of work that i just described then financial modeling is going to help you get a job in those industries and it's a even if you are a businessman who's into this area of analyzing investments financial modeling is just going to make your job a lot more easier and a lot more error free and a lot more efficient 
uh, in terms of skills required to build financial models, there are three major skills. One is mathematical or quantitative skills. You need to have the mathematical. You need to be a friend with numbers. If you're like, I don't like numbers. All these models are built on numbers there and a lot of numbers. So you need to have some quantitative and mathematical skills. You need to have qualitative skills to understand the macroeconomics, the microeconomics, the business, uh, the different um, decisions of business and what impact they will have on the share price. So you also need business management skills. You then need financial modeling skills in terms of Microsoft Excel. And then the last skill is something which I don't see here right now, which is communication skills. Because if you look at people in the investment banking industry or in the equity research uh, industry, they are really good communicators. They are people who can tell a story. They are people who can take a complex model like this and explain it to investors or clients or managers in very simple language because just explaining all of this calculations is going to take a lot of time and effort. So being not just the ability to build complex financial models, but the ability to explain them to others is also what is equally important. So these are some of the important skills that you need to build financial models. Keeping in mind these skills, EduPristine developed a program for financial modeling. Uh, which includes, it's a 14 day program, which includes uh, different sessions. Each day is a five hour session. And in each five hours, we are learning a new skill set. We start with understanding the basics of Excel. Day one is just to understand Excel because we'll be doing heavy modeling in Excel. Some of the people who join the course have experience with Excel, some of them don't. The first session is just built to level the playing field. A lot of people who think they have uh, experience with Excel, uh, they really don't. They only know about 10% of what Excel has to offer. The first day is to kind of at least give everyone the same amount of knowledge in Excel. Let them know of some formulas, some sum ifs, you know array formulas, um, pivot tables, shortcuts, etc. So that by the end of day one, everyone has the same level of Excel knowledge. Then we send, spend three sessions, which is 15 hours. Mind you, each session is a five hour session to build a model of equity research model for a company similar to the one that we just saw. And we go through each and every detail uh, spend time on it so that you understand how to build a because this is going to be the first financial model you ever build. We spend a lot of time in each and every small detail to explain that to you well. So we spend 15 hours building the financial model for a company like HDFC Bank or FMCG or whatever we uh, we have some of the examples we just saw. Then we spend two days, uh, which is 10 hours on building a project finance model or building a model for taking capital budgeting decisions, which is a decision like NPV, IRR, payback, looking at these numbers and deciding whether we should invest or not invest in a particular project. So that's what we spend two sessions on. Then we spend another two sessions on mergers and acquisitions. How do we build models for evaluating deals like a Microsoft and LinkedIn? What goes into evaluating that deal? What goes into taking that decision of whether one should go ahead with the merger and acquisition or should hold off on that and at what price. Then we spend two days on you completely building a model on your own from scratch. All right. The next two days are completely spent on you building models from scratch, uh, going online, downloading the data, creating a model so that by the end of the course, you're really hands on on building Excel models. Along with all of these sessions, uh, in between, we will also focus on things like macros, which are advanced Excel skills. So macros, for example, in the Excel file that I just showed you, even though this is a project finance case study, there is something called a custom scenario. In custom scenario, we allow the user to input assumptions according to them. So when I click on update custom scenario, I have a pop-up that comes up that asks for different assumptions. 
and I can make those changes on the fly and come up with a updated. So for example, let's say my exit value that I'm quoting goes from 10 to 100 and the cap capital expenditure goes from 90 to 85. And I click OK. My NPV and IRR update almost instantaneously. Within 10 seconds, I get my new NPV IRR. So if I want to build some custom scenario on the fly, I'm able to do that. I can run simulations. I can add graphs that I want to show a story. And on the graphs, I can select, deselect, check boxes to determine what I want to show on the graph, right? So all of these advanced Excel skills are something we'll teach in macros. Uh, we'll teach, we'll have a session for charting, how to build charts. And we'll also have a session for advanced Excel formulas like offset, index match, goal seek, solver, etc. So on and so forth. So that covers the 14 day course. Okay. Um, this is some of the sample content that we cover in the course. We've already gone through some of it. This is important. So this course, guys, is not just a course by Edu Pristine. It is a course in conjunction with the Bombay Stock Exchange. And BSC is, this is a very well reputed course because BSC has signed off on it. And for people participating on this course, uh, we'll get a certificate of participation. At the end of the course, there is going to be an exam. If you pass that exam, you will also get a certificate of excellence, which is a really high selling point on your CV. So because it's by BSC, it has a lot more weightage and is something that uh, recruiters will also give a lot more weightage to if it's there on your curriculum or your CV. Uh, let me just give you some background about Edu Pristine, uh, since some of you may not be familiar with this company. Edu Pristine is actually one of the pioneers of the financial modeling course in India. Uh, one of the first companies to start this course in India. Uh, the, the people, the founders of Edu Pristine are people who actually worked in companies like Standard Chartered Bank and big investment banks. In, the, in their company, they saw that there's this huge gap between people who they recruit, who are coming from colleges and uh, other companies and the kind of people they need for the job. So there's this huge gap between what the industry needs as a skill set versus what the education system in India is giving. They formed EduPristine to bridge this gap. So EduPristine and the course of financial modeling is essentially not a theoretical course that you should learn just to like you go to school and learn theory. It is actually a practical course where you're learning what real life people learn on the job. So you're getting trained on on the job attributes, which really increases your employability. Uh, looking at the potential of Edu Pristine, it was it was taken over by Adtelem Group, which is a huge edu global education provider in the US with about $3 billion um, uh, in valuation uh, and having about nine institutions, companies and 16,000 employees spread across the globe. And they are across 145 locations. Um, so that's that's a brief highlight about Edu Pristine. Uh, if you sign up for this course, you will also be eligible for a soft skill training. Like I said, when when I spoke about the skill sets that are important, your communication skills are also very important. And your communication skills are something that also determine uh, your performance in interviews and not on, just in interviews, but even once you're on the job, your ability to communicate with your colleagues, your peers, your bosses, your clients is going to determine your level of success in your career. So EduPristine also has a soft skill training that they give with this course uh, where they teach about how to speak properly, how to speak confidently, how to have clarity in what you present and what you talk about, how to understand what the other person is saying and how to reply to them, so on and so forth. So there's this whole section of soft skill trainings as well. Um, so kind of to summarize what EduPristine provides. So if you sign up for the course, you will get access to something called the LMS, Learning Management System. This is a one-stop solution for all your needs. 
any session that is taking place, the recordings of that session will be available on LMS. Any course content that you need to download, Excel file, PDF documents, PPTs, you will find on LMS. Any additional questions you want to ask, support you need, there will be a portal in LMS. So LMS is going to be like your one-stop solution for all the, all the different material that you need. Then they also have a 24 hour business support where if you, when you're practicing on your own and you come up with a question, you can go to this particular portal and ask that question and it will be answered by your Edupristine faculty all over India within 24 hours. They also have a support team in case you're facing problems with your IT, you know, IT issues like you're not able to connect to Zoom meeting, you're not able to connect to LMS, they will provide you IT support for that. And then there are uh, frequent seminars and webinars like the one we have right now, which take up a particular topic and just explain about the topic. So you will also get invited to all those seminars and webinars after the course is over. Uh, another USP I think uh, for Edupristine is that they only keep faculties. So after each and every session that you attend, you will have to give a feedback and they will only keep faculties that have a feedback of above 4.68. That is the average faculty rating here. If anyone usually gets below 4.5 for the financial modeling course, you don't get that faculty again. And 4.5 out of 5 is a very high standard. So most of the faculties that Edupristine has for financial modeling are really experts in that area and uh, are only people that students accept and give high ratings for if the moment you're rating for a particular faculty drops, that faculty will no longer teach you from the next session and you'll get another faculty. So that's another uh, USP. I think most people are also interested in understanding what is the placement assistance like. Uh, so in terms of placement assistance, uh, Edupristine does give you placement assistance. Edupristine actually is at a good position because a lot of Edupristine has a lot of industry contacts that keep reaching out to Edupristine saying, do you have any good people for financial modeling? Please let us know, we need a very good financial modeler. And it also has these set of students, uh, most, most of you who will probably sign up for the course, um, who have the skill set of financial modeling. So they do a good job of connecting students with the industry and helping them reach out. That being said, there is no placement guarantee. I want to be upfront from the very start Edupristine does not provide a placement guarantee that you take this course and you will get a job for sure through Edupristine. They will get you interviews or they will assist you in your resume building, in preparing for interviews and will also give you leads for the interviews. But eventually the onus to go and crack that interview is on you, which frankly should not be a problem if you've really done the course well. Uh, because the questions uh, in the interview and how you answer them eventually is up to the level of preparation you put in. Edupristine cannot sit in an interview and answer questions for you. So that's also about the placement assistance that Edupristine provides. Some of the clients, and this also uh, feeds into why we have industry contacts. Edupristine has delivered trainings to companies like KPMG, ENY, Bank of America, JP Morgan, Credit Suisse, Franklin Templeton, Mizzo, HSBC. These are big investment banks and big equity research firms that have reached to Edupristine saying, teach our employees financial modeling. And these are companies that also reach out to Edupristine saying, do you have any good financial modelers? So uh, the fact that Edupristine is in touch with the industry is very positive because they always keep getting requirements from the industry. Uh, Edupristine is also delivered in top colleges of the country, National University of Singapore, IIM Calcutta, FMS Delhi, ISB, IIM Indore, IIT, BITS, and a lot of top colleges also uh, call Edupristine to take sessions for them. So to sum up uh, the whole last 55 minutes, 59 minutes actually, uh, Edupristine will offer you classroom trainings now because of the pandemic. I think it's remote. I'm, I'm not completely sure about the plan to open live classroom trainings, but it's going to be 14 days and 70 hours. 
it's going to be an exhaustive five hour class every weekend saturday and sunday uh, you will be provided with all the excel workbooks uh, you will need to have ms excel installed on your machine and you will have to you will need a laptop for this course uh, because it's a practical course it's a live course where you're actually working and not just learning theory then uh, there are live webinars um, because of the pandemic you will have live online sessions on zoom which will also be recorded and the recordings will be provided to you you will get comprehensive study notes uh, all ppt pdf excel everything will be given to you in your lms you will get a certification from edupristine and bsc uh, we use a case study approach where real faculties who work in the real uh, real industry and real business problems will come and teach you real problems that the industry is facing rather than just learning textbook problems and then you'll also have support for any questions that you have at any time so this is in nutshell uh what we had for today yeah awesome i know we're at time uh quick check any questions so far guys any anyone any questions i'm happy to take them now What is the fee for this course? Um, actually, I'm a faculty here, not an Edupristine employee. So let me check if we have any faculty on the line. So if we have any Edupristine representative on the line, uh, I don't think we do right now. So uh, for the fee for the course, it's somewhere around thirty-five thousand or something. But don't quote me on that. Uh, if you could just reach out to your Edupristine coordinator, if you fill the form before the survey, uh, before the start of the seminar, uh, an Edupristine coordinator will reach out to you. They will, they will let you know what the exact uh, course uh, fee for the course is. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, guys? Cool. I guess that is it. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. It's been uh, really great interacting with you guys. Uh, thanks for some of the great questions you asked. And uh, look forward to seeing you again. And all the best. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.